thanks for joining us today. Um, we're going to have quite a few others um, joining as we um, begin here, but we're going to, we've got a lot to cover in a really short amount of time. So we're just going to start and jump right in. <clears throat> um, I'm Kelly O'Brien. I'm the executive director of the Us Against Alzheimer's Brain Health Partnership. And I'm also joined by uh, Niles Godis and a number of my other um, team members. Niles is our chief policy officer. He is off camera from, for some technical issues, but very much on deck for this discussion. So just wanted to throw that out there in case in the Q&A there are policy uh, related questions. Um, I know this is a really busy week uh, as Congress races to finish its work for the year. So the fact that everybody's here says a lot about your commitment to Alzheimer's. And again, I just really wanna say um, thank you so much for your time. I want to just go through a couple of meeting logistics before we dive in um, to hopefully make this go as smooth as possible. Um, everybody should be on mute. And when we get to the Q&A section, um, we'll ask you um, in case you forget to take yourself off mute. Um, but please do keep that mute on during the, the first part of the, um, the briefing, um, just to keep the ambient noise as low as we can. Uh, each speaker is going to talk for just about 10 minutes, so it'll be relatively brief. Um, and we do want this to be a two-way conversation. So um, there are two ways to ask a question when we get to that point. Um, well, throughout, you can always throw up a question or a comment on the chat. So highly encourage you to use that. Uh, if by chance we don't get to your question, we can always come back to it later, um, offline if needed. So please feel free to post in the chat. And we also have that raise hand feature. So when we do get to the Q&A live session, um, we'll be um, uh, calling on as many people as we possibly can who've indicated that they have a question and then we'll ask you to take yourself off mute and ask your question of the speaker. Uh, a recording of this briefing will be available on our website and we'll send around a link um, really, really soon after this, um, after this event. Um, so you um, don't have to worry about taking notes. You'll have a copy of this. Um, and with that, I am just gonna give a couple of brief comments before I introduce our first speaker. Um, Us Against Alzheimer's has been working for a decade to end Alzheimer's disease. We fight for more research dollars to find a cure. We work for early detection, for health equity, for better care, for paid leave for caregivers. And we have, with the help of so many people on this call today and many, many others, made a lot of progress. Um, but as we all know, there's so much more that we need to do. Um, the science of Alzheimer's has been really challenging. Um, there is deep-seated health inequalities. Um, for people living with Alzheimer's and dementia, this disease can be emotionally and financially overwhelming. Uh, but with your help, we continue to fight for solutions. And as we discussed today, there is there's a lot of reason to be very hopeful. Some people on this call may be surprised that we're here to talk about preventing Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Um, but the evidence is clear that we can reduce the risk of getting Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, prevention um, therefore does seem perhaps on the horizon. Um, and importantly, a lot of the protective and risk reducing interventions that help are things that need to be done across the lifespan. So preventing dementia in later life really starts in early life. And if we think about this just as an issue for older people, uh, we're gonna be really late. Um, we need to start much, much earlier. And it's also true, importantly, especially for the folks on this call, that individuals and families just cannot be expected to do this alone. Um, our health system needs to support early intervention and prevention. And, and that's one of the reasons that we're here today. If we really wanna maximize this science of prevention, we need a national focus and a concerted accountable plan. And the payoff of doing this is big. Uh, even if we only delayed the average onset of dementia for five years, we could cut the number of people living with it in half and save by some estimates nearly $600 billion over the next 30 years. So 
we at Us Against Alzheimer's think that setting a national goal to reduce the number of people that develop Alzheimer's and other dementias and putting a plan in place to reach that goal should be a top priority for the incoming president and the new Congress. Um, this is something that um, Us Against Alzheimer's along with more than 165, actually as of this morning, I think we're uh, close to 175 organizations such as the American Heart Association, the YMCA, the National Urban League, um, Unidos US, Volunteers of America, and many, many others have been advocating for. Um, and for this reason, we are hosting this briefing to begin this conversation about what more we can all be doing to prevent Alzheimer's and other dementias. And we've invited two notable experts to talk about the facts around this. Um, Dr. Lisa Barnes, who's a cognitive neuropsychologist in the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center, professor of gerontology and geriatric medicine, and someone who's internationally recognized for her contributions to minority aging and minority health. And we have a surprise speaker, um, Dr. Quincy Samus, um, the director of the Memory and Aging Services and Innovation Center, who is pinch hitting for Laura Getland, um, who woke up really pretty sick this morning. So Quincy, we are just so grateful to you. Um, Quincy was also a member of the um, Lancet Commission and um, I have no doubt that um, her presentation will be fabulous. Um, and of course, last but not least, you'll hear remarks from Mandy Moore, who many of you know from This Is Us, but we have come to know her as an incredible activist and supporter of this work. Um, and Mandy was planning to be here with, uh, with us live and in person, but was, um, was pulled away by the shooting schedule rather last minute. So she was kind enough to record some of her remarks for us. So we'll still hear from her and it's worth hearing. Um, so um, we look forward to that as well. So I now want to turn this over to Dr. Lisa Barnes with the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center, who's been studying the impact of Alzheimer's and dementia on communities of color for decades, to talk with us about the impact of this disease and why urgent action is so needed. Dr. Barnes. Thank you, Kelly. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here today. Um, as you heard, I am a cognitive neuropsychologist and professor in the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center at Rush University Medical Center, which is an academic medical center in Chicago. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us today. And I would also like to thank Us Against Alzheimer's for organizing this incredibly important briefing and for inviting me to participate. My area of expertise is focused on health disparities of Alzheimer's dementia in older adults, with a particular focus on older African Americans. And today I will give a brief update on the impact of Alzheimer's in diverse populations and among women. So as you can see in the slide on the left, there are currently more than 5 million people living with Alzheimer's. And because the US is an aging society where people are living longer and longer and Alzheimer's is a disease of aging, this 5 million number is expected to nearly triple to over 14 million people by 2060. And that's unless we find a cure or figure out how to prevent the disease. At the same time that we're facing this looming public health crisis, we're also living in a nation that's becoming increasingly diverse. If you look at the graph on the right, it shows projections of the population by race and ethnicity from 2010 to 2050. In 2010, non-Hispanic whites made up about 65% of the population, but this population is expected to drop about 46% by 2050, and they will no longer be the majority. In contrast, all other racial and ethnic groups will have increases in their populations, with Hispanics having the most dramatic increase. Now this graph is for the entire population, but if you were to focus in on adults over the age of 65, the population that's most at risk for Alzheimer's, the increase in the older diverse populations is even larger. So for example, by 2030, the Latino older population will grow over 200% and the African American older population will grow over 100% compared to only a 65% growth for non-Hispanic white older adults. 
these two trends, a growing number of people affected with Alzheimer's and a more diverse nation is important because the populations that are most rapidly growing are the same populations that are disproportionately burdened by Alzheimer's. Next slide, please. It's estimated that older African-Americans and Latinos have about a one and a half to two times greater risk of Alzheimer's compared to older white adults. Here I'm showing you some of the best evidence that we have of this disparity from a large study out of Kaiser in Oakland, California. They examined dementia incidents from 2000 to 2013 in over 270,000 healthcare members over the age of 65. And while most previous studies only have data for three groups, whites, African-Americans, and Latinos, this study looked at a much more diverse group of people. And what you can see is that African-Americans and Native Americans had the highest rates of dementia. Latinos, Pacific Islanders, and whites had intermediate rates, and Asians had the lowest rates. But if you combine the minority populations in just 10 years, they will make up nearly 40% of the American families affected by Alzheimer's dementia, which is a really frightening statistic. You'll hear more about risk factors and risk reduction in the next presentation, but I'll just say that the reasons for the disparities among these racial and ethnic groups is not fully understood. Although there are a number of ideas, including the influence of social factors like education and the impact of medical conditions like the higher rates of vascular conditions in these populations. But one important challenge that I'd like to note in our understanding of disparities is the persistent under-inclusion of these groups in clinical research studies, as well as a general lack of awareness and knowledge about the disease within the communities themselves. Next slide. Another segment of the population that is disproportionately burdened by this disease is women. We know that almost two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women and Alzheimer's is the fifth leading cause of death in women while it's the seventh leading cause in men. And two thirds of more than 15 million Americans caring for someone with Alzheimer's are women. And the rates are even higher if you look at Latino and African-American caregivers. We also know that on average, female caregivers spend more time caregiving than male caregivers. The graph on the right shows data from another study, the Framingham Heart Study, on lifetime risks of Alzheimer's dementia by age and sex. And as you can see, the estimated lifetime risk for Alzheimer's dementia is higher for women at both ages 45 and 65. Now, the most often cited reason for this higher rate among women is the fact that women live longer than men on average. And as we know, age is the greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's. But longer longevity among women is probably not the entire story. And we need much more research to understand the biological and social differences between women and men that could be affecting the development of this disease. So I'll stop here and turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you. Dr. Barnes, um, this is clearly an issue that has such incredible urgency for families, um, for all families, but in particular for families of color. And, um, you know, women are bearing so much of the burden here um, all around. Um, so uh, really appreciate these sobering statistics and um, absolutely, um, for me at least, I feel the urgency around addressing this as it, the trajectory looks worse, <laughs> not better. Um, addressing Alzheimer's and dementia is a um, really important health equity issue and it just, it just can't be ignored if we're gonna address this emergency. And in fact, it may be the way through in some ways. Um, I want to also now welcome um, Dr. Samus. Um, we're so honored to have you here with us today, Quincy. I know that you, um, and again, I just wanna say again, I appreciate you so much um, hinting here um, for Dr. Gitlin. Um, I know that you also serve on Lancet and um, that you've been evaluating the science around some of the solutions um, to these challenges um, and really um, look forward to your comments um, 
your comments as well. So you can unmute yourself and I'm gonna put myself back on mute so we can hear your presentation. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kelly, Niles, and Us Against Alzheimer's for the honor to bring to this hearing the latest evidence as it concerns the science around risk reduction and prevention of Alzheimer's disease and related disorders. As you mentioned, I'm presenting uh, on behalf of Dr. Laura Gitlin, who was unexpectedly unable to be with us today. Um, to understand the science concerning the prevention of dementia, I will briefly summarize the key findings from a critical report that was just um, this July published in The Lancet, which is receiving worldwide attention and recognition in guiding national policies. This report was led by Dr. Jill Livingston of the University College in London, who assembled a group of 28 international scientists to review the evidence on dementia prevention, intervention, and care, and to provide a synthesis of the findings. This report updates and extends an earlier Lancet 2017 publication of the commission's findings. Along with Dr. Gitlin, I was one of 28 scientists participating in this review. Uh, Dr. Gitlin and I have been involved in the de development, testing, and dissemination of dementia care interventions for decades. Well, not decades for me, maybe 15 years for me. <laughs> for her, 40 years. In that capacity, we have collectively met with and enrolled um, in research thousands of families in the US who are living with dementia. Today, I will be presenting Dr. Gitlin's testimony and discussing the key and very exciting findings of the Lancet reports, which is the identification of risk factors for dementia that can actually be modified. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. Actually, I'm sorry. Go back one slide. I would like to, so if, yeah, there you go. I would like to start out with four major conclusions from this report or key takeaways, all of which reflect hope and good news. Given that there are no disease modifying medications or cures, and given the increasing prevalence of dementia with an aging society, prevention is critical. So the first key point is that based on the strong evidence we have so far, uh, the potential for prevention is great. Also, based on the evidence, we can conclude that it is never too early in life or too late in life to prevent dementia. Third, as you'll see shortly, there are multiple modifiable risk factors and the greatest impact in reducing risks is if we can address all of them over the life course um, or at least more than one. And then fourth, the greatest impact for reducing risk of dementia may be for those in the highest risk groups. Um, Dr. Barnes just shared with you the inequities in prevalence rates and the differential effects for African-Americans and women and Latinos in particular. A related point is that you will see the risk factors cluster around health inequities. And if we can address those, we will in turn great impact on dementia prevalence. Okay, next slide. So in this Lancet report, through an extensive review of scientific publications, including meta-analyses, systematic reviews, and individual studies, we have identified 12 factors um, to have sufficient evidence to suggest their role in reducing dementia risk. Of importance, these factors are all modifiable and reflect the need for health policy actions or actions at the individual level. These factors reflect risks over the life course, starting with education in the early years, to factors that contribute to risk in midlife and to those contributing to dementia in late life. These factors suggest that it's never too early or too late in life to reduce risk for dementia, and prevention is possible and important at every stage of life. The original Lancet Commission report in 2017 identified nine factors. And in this report, based on new evidence, this new report in 2020, based on new evidence, we identified three additional factors that were added into the model. This includes excessive alcohol consumption, traumatic brain injury, and air pollution. Okay, next slide. 
So this is a graphic showing the life course perspective and risk factors over the life course. Taken together, oh, sorry, together the 2020 risk factor life course model of dementia prevention identifies these 12 modifiable risk factors that account for around 40% of the worldwide dementias, which could potentially be prevented or delayed. In other words, the evidence suggests that modifying these 12 risk factors may, might prevent or delay up to 40% of dementias. The life course model shown here identifies the relative contribution of each factor to reducing risk. It suggests that addressing early education, hearing loss, followed by smoking, contribute most to this model. Also, Whereas addressing risk in early life would re result in a 7% reduction, addressing factors only in midlife would lead to a 15% reduction. And whereas only addressing factors in late life would result in an 18% reduction in the risk of dementia. Again, if we're able to address all of these factors, 40% of dementia could potentially be prevented or delayed leading more time to, with leading to higher quality of life and more time. The percentage by which dementia risk can be reduced may be even higher among populations with health inequities and who disproportionately experience chronic diseases such as the diabetes and also those who do not have access to hearing tests and hearing aids and other equipment um, uh, and also those who live in communities with high air pollution. For the population at large, however, this leaves 60% of risk not accounted for. But with research, we may be able to uh, reduce risk even more. Next slide, please. You may well ask how these risk factors can prevent dementia. Well, two mechanisms have been identified as accounting for dementia risk reduction. As shown in this slide, some factors can prevent dementia by reducing the neuropathological damage through in inflammatory processes or amyloid or tau buildup in the brain. Other factors can prevent dementia by increasing cognitive reserve. And some factors can prevent dementia by doing both of these things. Next slide, please. This life course model for risk reduction leads us to a number of recommendations at the population level and at the individual level. The recommendations at the population level include things like prioritizing and making sure childhood education uh, is high quality for all. Public health policies directed at reducing things like hypertension risk could also um, help at the population level, as well as developing po policies encouraging social, cognitive, and physical activity ac across the life course. Examples of individual level recommendations include things like ensuring people receive treatment for their hypertension in midlife. Also, making sure people have access to hearing aids for hearing loss and avoiding um, high consumption of alcohol. That is um, where I will stop for now. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Fantastic, thank you so much. That was a really wonderful overview. Um, very much appreciate, again, Quincy, your, um, your participation today. Um, I do, before I go to our next um, speaker, I do wanna just remind folks that you are um, encouraged to post up your questions in the chat or indicate that you have a question um, for one or both of these speakers by using the raise hand feature in the participant um, button. Um, so um, after we hear from our next speaker, from Andy Moore, we will um, we'll go to some good discussion and some Q&A. Um, I, I now have this great fun pleasure to introduce Mandy Moore, who really doesn't need any introduction. Um, but I do want to just take this opportunity um, to say that, you know, you may know her from TV or from her incredible songwriting and, um, and her other creative endeavor, endeavors, but what you may not know about Mandy is how committed she is uh, to this cause and what an incredible down to earth, roll up your sleeves, 
sign me up advocate she has been on this issue. Um, you know, I think we've all worked from time to time with lots of um, celebrities. Um, and um, I can honestly say that her commitment to this is, is true. Um, so I'm really excited um, to, um, to show you this um, little clip from Mandy. I also wanted to mention that she's uh, currently serving as the national ambassador to the Us Against Alzheimer's Be Brain Powerful campaign, which is working to empower women and educate women around this issue. Um, and Ambassador is really pretty much an understatement um, for her uh, work to raise awareness. So um, I'll, let, I'll let Mandy tell you and we'll just go to the video. Thanks, Amber. Hi, everyone. I am Mandy Moore. I'm sorry, I was really hoping to join you live this morning for this very important Hill briefing. Unfortunately, we are currently in the midst of production still on This Is Us. I wasn't able to sort of juggle things around and coordinate uh, uh, the schedule enough to be there with you. So I apologize. I'm sure it's been a very inspiring morning. So to give you a little bit of a backstory as to why I'm here, um, I play Rebecca Pearson on NBC's This Is Us. It's um, a role that I really cherish, a role that's really touched my heart. Um, and I play this woman from her mid-20s to her mid 80s and last season my character present day about her late 60s was diagnosed with alzheimer's disease and during the course of that season we really focused on how the family in particular um her three adult children my three adult children really coped um you get to see the impact that this disease has on not just her but the entire family and obviously it's 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 a role and a position that has really motivated me to to speak up and speak out for people living with this disease and to urge action on prevention and brain health in general. Um, I, I also want to add my thanks to all of you for participating in this important briefing at such a critical and, and busy time. And just to thank you for all that you do to advance policies that support the health and well being of all Americans. So in my research for my role as Rebecca, I've really, I've had the, the wonderful opportunity to speak with many experts and people living with Alzheimer's and other dementias. And I was incredibly surprised to learn a lot of the facts that you guys know of and are, are, are uh, talking about today. Um, the fact that women are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's as men, that African-American and Latina women uh, are diagnosed with Alzheimer's at disproportionate rates, um, uh, disproportionately higher rates, that is, uh, that women pay the majority of the direct cost of Alzheimer's. It's estimated that women bear 80% of the disease's total economic burden, including medical costs and elder care and assisted living. I've also learned about the importance of early detection and diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease. And unfortunately, we all know that early detection doesn't happen often enough, and in many cases, cases go unrecognized. Um, I've also learned, very importantly, that there are things that I can do, that we all can do right now in the span of our lifetime uh, to reduce our risk of living with dementia later in life. That is why I have decided to use my voice to help raise awareness for how important it is to support brain health. I am proud to be the new ambassador for the Us Against Alzheimer's Be Brain Powerful campaign. And this particular campaign is aiming to empower women specifically to improve their brain health through exercise and uh, nutrition, um, sleep, social connection, and preventing or managing chronic conditions such as diabetes and heart disease. But obviously families can't do this alone. Women can't do this alone. Our healthcare system, including our clinical care system and public health need to do more to support wellness. These messages about brain health need to be reinforced by our healthcare providers and services really need to be paid for by our health plans and facilitated by our community public health environment. Because let's Face it, it is high time the United States have this very important national conversation about Alzheimer's. You know, our country has to make a national commitment to do everything we can to prevent more people 
from living with Alzheimer's and dementia. Us Against Alzheimer's is leading an effort to encourage our government leaders to embrace a national prevention goal for Alzheimer's. Establishing a national prevention goal obviously would be a game changer for the way our country responds to Alzheimer's. Over the long run, it could save millions of lives and spare countless families from the heartache of this disease. I hope that members of Congress will support this effort. Dementia prevention should be a priority in this moment when real change feels possible. So for all of you participating here today, thank you again. And thank you to Us Against Alzheimer's for inviting me to share my thoughts. Thank you very much. Yay. Thank you, Mandy. She's so fabulous, isn't she? Um, really, really appreciate her support um, uh, for this effort. And, and again, all of you as well. Um, we have um, a lot of people on this call today, which is great. Um, and I'm sure there are quite a few questions. Um, so again, just want to remind you, if you'd like to type your question into the chat, um, go for it. If you have a question, um, please um, use the raise hand feature, or you can just try to wave us down. We'll do our best. Um, my colleague Brooks is going to help me triage questions. Um, I was going to start with one, though, that came to mind after hearing um, both Dr. Barnes and Dr. Samus. Um, I'm just wondering uh, about your perspective on this. Um, it, it seems to me that um, when you look at the, the evidence around um, the fact that women really bear a lot of the um, burden around this, such a high prevalence among women, and also that women are caregivers and the risk factors that have so much to do with midlife and you know, incorporate things like social isolation and, and depression. It seems to me like you know, caregiving women, um, perhaps from communities of color are a really important place to start for some of this work. And I'd be just curious to know if you've given any thought to that and um, your perspective about um, how we begin to focus our prevention efforts and where we could have some of the greatest impact. Um, I'll, I'll, either one of you I'd be happy to hear from, but um, it's just something that's sort of present in my mind this morning as I listen to both of you. So I'll jump in first, Quincy, and then you can take over. I think that's a really great question, Kelly. Um, and I, I agree that the, the disparities that we see among women in general are probably amplified in, in communities of color for women because of all the reasons that you stated. And I think um, we face another barrier with addressing this in these communities because I, I think that the, the knowledge about Alzheimer's and risk prevention hasn't permeated fully to these communities, right? So we have to do a lot more to make sure we can reach communities of color and raise awareness that Alzheimer's is not um, an inevitable consequence of aging. You know, a lot of minority communities think that you are supposed to lose your memory when you get older and there's nothing that can be done. But, you know, as we've heard from Quincy's presentation, there are lots of things that we can do to prevent risk of, of this disease. But um, because the information is, is not out there and because a lot of times uh, communities of color are not included in research studies where we're getting all of this information, these communities, you know, they don't think that this information applies to them. And it may not, right? Because we don't have enough data to know that. So I think our efforts should be squarely focused on number one, educating communities about how important this is. And then number two, really trying to um, encourage people to become involved in research so that whatever we find out about this disease can be applied to all populations, not just the majority white population. Yeah, and I would um, definitely echo everything that Dr. Barnes just said. Um, and I would also uh, maybe add um, that some of these communities of color um, have uh, really fantastic um, community-based uh, organizations that can be used as, um, as tools to help with this education and uh, in intervention. Um, and so we should really think about how we can take a community-based approach uh, you know, to public health and to uh, addressing all of these um, these potentially modifiable risk factors over the life course. 
Thank you. And Kelly, we do have a question in the chat. Um, right. I'm happy to read. It's for Dr. Seamus. Uh, you noted that addressing hearing loss in midlife can reduce the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. What data do we have supporting this? And does it extend to addressing hearing loss later in life? Uh, for example, people older than 65. Yeah, really great quest question. And um, and so um, the Lancet, so we had two Lancet reports. The first, um, uh, for the first report, hearing loss had the highest potentially uh, preventable risk factor for uh, for hearing loss uh, in midlife. Um, and so we're talking about um, cohort studies uh, of people who are about 59 years old or so on average. Um, and these this data was based on um, meta-analyses of uh, quite a few studies looking at hearing loss and how that contributes to cognitive uh, decline later. Um, and so based on the available evidence, it, um, it suggests that it's um, uh, that hearing loss in midlife is um, a factor that uh, that is uh, related to uh, future cognitive decline. Um, but there is uh, less uh, convincing evidence that uh, correcting hearing loss in later life could potentially be, uh, be uh, uh, attributable to slower decline or risk prevention. So it's really the evidence right now suggests midlife hearing loss. If we can affect that, then that would lead to, uh, to prevention of dementia later. Hopefully that answers your question. Thanks, Dr. Samus. Other questions? Looking to see if others are raising their hand. I think I Dr. Vega has a question. Yes. Well, uh, just a, a, a question, comment, I guess. Uh, I think the Lancer Report is absolutely a wonderful contribution, uh, not only because it's so concise and summarizing all the big issues, but the recommendations. Of course, it's the recommendations where we have a problem in terms of policy and programs and who will generate them and who will implement them. And uh, one of the things I think that uh, is under, uh, understated in, in the report is the fact that the model really is it's an additive uh, sort of approach where you look at, you know, at the percentages and add them up. But in, in point of fact, I mean, when we understand that uh, we have actually diminishing rates among upper income and upper, middle upper, upper income whites in the United States. Uh, we understand what, what the roots of those are and they really have to do with socioeconomic disadvantage and low education. And the fact that in fact, it's, it's not just additive when you look across all these midlife factors of, uh, of disparities related uh, diabetes and inflammation related uh, problems. It's actually linked to the interaction of very low education, and low education starts with poor preschool, poor performance uh, by middle school and, and, and even before, which uh, obviously turns into a different life course opportunity uh, that affects uh, the question of exposures to toxins, affects the, er the issues around regular health care and maintenance of health care, it affects diet and behavior. So it's really uh, underplays, I think, the role that education, early education and preparation has and not only developing mental resilience from the standpoint of organic capability, but also from the standpoint of life course channeling of individuals. And I, I think that that, you know, I think when we get into discussing these things in the most easy to reach solutions, policy-wise become education. I mean, I'm sorry, become things like medically available, you know, uh, responses. Secondarily become things that we can do uh, that we, we can do that, that seem easy, easier to do or more feasible to do. However, the least feasible thing to do, perhaps from the standpoint of policy, is education change and education performance. And I think that we can't understate that too much, that so we have to do something fundamental if we really want to approach this from a 30-year perspective or 40-year perspective to have results. Excellent comment. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Fantastic. It's, it's fundamental, as you said. Um, Kelly, another question that just came through to me in the private chat, um, Mandy Moore met, mentioned that 
cases of Alzheimer's disease often go unnoticed or diagnosis happens late? Do we, do we understand the factors around that? I can speak for the diverse populations. Um, that is certainly a fact that um, there are data out that when d these diverse populations get a diagnosis is often much later in the disease course. And so some of that is around, you know, under recognition of symptoms, right? And knowing that it's, there's something actually a, a dementia process going on. Um, but it's also, you know, probably tied to the relationship that these diverse communities have with the healthcare um, community, you know, healthcare as, as a whole. We know that there has been strained relationships um, because of, you know, past medical abuse and, and discrimination and racism. And so a lot of times, you know, people don't want to go to a doctor or they don't have access to um, these tertiary uh, memory clinics where you would get your diagnosis. So, um, you know, in my research, I, I enroll people who don't have dementia and I follow them over time to understand the risk factors for Alzheimer's. And we do see that there is a glaring under recognition of symptoms and that when people do get the disease, you know, the families, when they become involved, it's, it's much, much later down the, um, down the line when, you know, when the symptoms have become so bad that you can't say, oh, you know, mom is just being a little bit forgetful. By the time they bring them in, it's really, you know, more issues with behavioral problems and things like that. And I think Kelly uh, and Brooks, if I could, is Russ Paulson, I'm the chief operating officer of Us Against Alzheimer's. And we have a, a bill in Congress called the Change Act that, that tries to address this lack of early detection. Um, if you look at studies academically outside of diverse populations, um, ranges from 30 to 70% of people with, who, who die with Alzheimer's disease have never been told that they have Alzheimer's disease. It depends on who you, who you talk to about what that percentage is, but 30 to 70%. Um, there are lots of speculation as to why that is, but there's not a lot of evidence. We did our own study uh, just last year of what matters most to patients living with Alzheimer's, what are the things that are most important for them to maintain and the things most important for them to uh, avoid as they think about disease progression. And everyone who was in that study had been referred to us via physician for having some kind of memory problem. They got to us through a doctor. And in that study of people who had been referred to us by a doctor as having Alzheimer's disease, 30% of them said they'd never been told they had Alzheimer's disease. So this really is a significant problem. It's why we have the Change Act in front of Congress. Um, and it's why we think that legislation sort of requiring an assessment of people at their welcome to Medicare visit and their annual wellness check is so important because absent rigorous evaluation, people just aren't being told. And I would also add that I think, you know, we've also learned here at Us Against Alzheimer's where there might be an understanding and awareness of the disease. There's not really a narrative for people to know how to raise the topic, either with their loved ones um, in their communities or with their providers. And so unlike other diseases where we may, we may talk about heart disease, we may talk about cancer, the stigma still remains uh, with Alzheimer's disease that as consumers, we need to, we need to learn that narrative and learn how to have those conversations, um, which I, I think is an important part of the puzzle as well. Um, Kelly, we have another question um, for I think either of our speakers. Do any particular risk factors like TBI or hypertension correlate to earlier onset versus onset at later ages? I, I can uh, I can take that, but could I just go back um, and add one thing to the prior uh, conversation, which is you know I think a really important conversation because if we cannot um, get people uh, diagnosed um, proactively, um, it's exactly right. By the time people um, end up with a diagnosis, they're in the emergency department with a with a hip fracture or with behavioral problems of, like wandering. Um, so one other piece of that puzzle is uh, is making it uh, more. Uh, incentivized for providers to feel comfortable making that diagnosis. Many providers um, are overwhelmed. Uh, most people receive dementia care through their 
primary care providers. And um, many times um, these providers may be nihilistic about uh, why diagnose dementia when you can't cure it. Well, the fact is, is that the there is a huge body of literature suggesting the um, effectiveness of um, a number of behavioral um, and symptom-focused uh, treatment approaches, including care coordination and very specific uh, approaches to like non-pharmacological behavior management. And so one of the policy-related changes that we could make is help uh, help uh, incentivize um, uh, providers through uh, changes in care financing to better be able to spend time uh, making the diagnosis and then creating care plans that allow uh, not just medical needs uh, to be assessed and met, but also many of these uh, social and uh, supportive care needs for both the patient as well as the family member. So, uh, so changes in Medicare uh, towards value-based care uh, would go a long way. So I'll stop there. <laughs> um, in terms of, uh, of particular risk factors like TBI and, and hypertension and whether they correlate to early onset or, or um, versus onset at later ages. So um, I just quickly looked through the Lancet publication and based on uh, the data presented uh, from the meta-analyses that were in that paper, it suggests that TBI, um, uh, uh, dementia is more likely to come uh, closer to the time of its traumatic brain injury. So that would suggest a, an acceleration of, um, of, of time to, uh, to dementia, um, but there uh, is no similar um, uh, similar finding in terms of hypertension. So if someone has hypertension in midlife, um, the uh, data shows that they are at higher risk in later life of developing dementia, but there's less of a correlation of um, temporal uh, correlation there. So I hope that makes sense. That's helpful. Um, one question that is in the chat um, that comes up quite a bit in general, in the general public, and maybe this is an opportunity to sort of address the science around this, um, are supplements. And um, there's a lot of the challenges that we have in, um, in um, the World Wide Web and everything else is there's lots of information in, um, for consumers and, and others about what works and what doesn't work. So what, um, and memory supplements, um, uh, uh, for example, and I'm, uh, I would love um, just to address this um, participant's question about, about memory supplements in general and how, um, how the science sort of looks at those issues and how we should as consumers um, think about, think about um, the marketing and, and what, we, um, what we see on the shelves. I, I don't know if there was anything in the Lancet about this, but um, I participated in a, um, on a committee with the National Academies of Science it used to be IOM, they changed their name to something longer, um, a few years before the Lancet report. And we did an extensive review of, um, of observational studies. And we didn't find any evidence that supplement use was effective in preventing cognitive decline or risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, that was around, I wanna say maybe 2017, 2018. Um, and so maybe the Lancet uh, addressed that in the later report, but as far as I know, in research that we've looked at, supplement use is not effective. Yes, um, so I, I agree. And so the Lancet report in 2020 um, did look at um, dietary um, interventions, including things like the use of B vitamins and E vitamin and vitamin E. Um, and, uh, and also um, dietary uh, uh, things like the Mediterranean diet. Um, so there was not a lot of evidence um, that showed um, a, um, uh, a big risk reduction for these types of things. Um, and so they, it was not included um, in the, uh, the final model. Thanks, Dr. Samus. I will just add that um, we at Rush are currently conducting um, a, a, a clinical trial to look at the MIND diet. 
to see if it can delay uh, cognitive decline in people at high risk for Alzheimer's. Um, and so that trial is, is underway now. The, the PI who led that trial and created the MIND diet um, unfortunately passed away in February of this year, and we're continuing the study, um, but we hope to have an answer um, by the summertime as to whether, you know, eating a healthy diet um, consisting of, you know, fruits and vegetables, green leafy vegetables, if that can delay uh, decline in older adults. Thanks, Dr. Barnes. It looks like we have a question from Michael Allenbogen. Michael, did you want to unmute? Yeah, thanks uh, for this. Uh, I just like to bring a little attention to possibility of why some doctors aren't making that diagnosis. And I think we need to look at the possibilities of how some people may be penalized because they do get a diagnosis. Some of the states, as you already probably know, is that if a person gets a diagnosis of dementia, they immediately have to stop driving. And a lot of the doctors that I've spoken with who are neurologists said that it doesn't make sense for them to put that on their medical record if there's no benefits from them getting health uh, help uh, because there's nothing that can be done at this point in time if somebody has dementia. So by them putting that on their record, it's just going to penalize them. And the other thing I've heard from some doctors who are neurologists, they also claim that by writing that they have dementia, that creates a whole bunch of extra paperwork that they would not have to do. So they said there's no benefits by them putting that on a chart because again, it doesn't benefit the patient anyway, but it creates a lot of havoc and paperwork for them. So these are things that I've actually spoken privately with some neurologists who probably won't say it publicly. And I think we have to question them better to understand why they don't do these things. I don't think it's just a matter of not being able to come up with a diagnosis. Thank you. That's, um, you know, I think, you know, as someone, I've worked quite a bit in the mental health space and um, as, as, as we all know, that's an area where there's quite a bit of stigma um, and um, it, it's a refrain. And when you're talking about the challenges on the provider side and the paperwork and the um, implications, I think, I I, um, I hear some synergies um, around some of these challenges um, for both providers and for patients as it relates to some of the stigma of the societal barriers as well. I don't know, Dr. Samus, if you have a comment. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. And that's exactly um, the challenges and barriers that we hear uh, in, the, in the field as well and in practice. And um, so I think in terms of aligning incentives for um, helping primary care providers um, uh, uh, feel comfortable making that diagnosis, um, there are things that could potentially be done such as um, what um, like alternative payment uh, models, um, such as what um, CMS is actually uh, gonna be uh, piloting nationally in the coming uh, years, which is the, um, the primary care models, which basically um, incentivizes uh, primary care providers to, um, to provide uh, more uh, coordinated care um, to reduce overall risk of um, health utilization and costs um, to Medicare. Um, and so um, the, in that way, they would actually be able to receive more, uh, more uh, uh, payments per month per, per, per attributed patient, um, as well as potentially share in, um, in uh, savings um, that would come back to them or their practice if they were able to, for example, keep people with dementia who are at high risk for um, hospitalizations out of the hospital. So there are some potential exciting models um, for care, for providing better care that, uh, that would align those incentives. Um, Kelly, another question um, in the chat related to the prevention goal. We've talked a lot about our efforts for the national, calling on government to adopt a national prevention goal. Mandy Moore mentioned it. Um, and this person just asked to share a bit more about what that looks like and, and what people can do who are listening in today. 
Oh, thanks. Thank you very much, Brooks. Um, that's a great question. And um, I'm eager to hear Dr. Samus and, and, and Dr. Burns on this as well. But uh, one of the things I think that um, uh, history has shown us is that um, action is often spurred by a goal. And that when you have a clear objective and when you have measured milestones to that objective, um, it's amazing how things can happen. Um, when um, the uh, National um, Alzheimer's Project Act, for example, passed um, a decade ago, it included a 2025 goal for treatment. And, and that had resulted and has resulted in just exponential increases in funding for research around um, around treatment in particular and action on a number of other uh, really important care and treatment um, uh, and you know innovations. Um, prevention um, alongside that, the science has evolved and we feel like the time is right to, to do the same and similar thing and that we need to have this focus. It, you know, it does a couple of things in addition to really leveraging you know, policy momentum and the kind of momentum around some of the changes that we need to make that we've heard about today. It also helps just in its on its face um, present the notion to the public that this is actually something possible and really helps um, elevate our um, goal, all of our goal to educate and empower people around this idea that there is um, the opportunity for risk reduction. I think what's really exciting about this idea uh, for me is that if you look at the Lancet Commission report and a lot of the other research, this is not just about dementia. Uh, I mean, doing this sort of um, endeavor, setting a national goal can actually um, help lift all boats. I mean, it is in order to get there, you have to address hypertension, you have to address obesity, you have to address um, you know, hearing, you have to, so all of these things and you have to address health inequities. So um, there's this incredibly exciting opportunity, I think, to connect these issues across risk factors um, to elevate not just clinical changes and research, but also public health, um, which in this age of COVID, we've all learned how important this is um, and has been just incredibly underfunded and, and um, underfocused. So um, you know, I'd love um, comments from our speakers or others, but um, you know, we are really fighting hard. Um, the Napa Council Advisory Council did recommend that that work commence and that we develop a, a goal. And so um, that work is, um, is beginning to be underway. Um, and uh, we're excited about that, but um, very much encouraged um, by the momentum and uh, need Congress and need the administration really to um, elevate this and to make this a priority if we're gonna, if we're gonna get this done. Um, but I'll leave final comments to Dr. Samus and, and Barnes before we close on that note, if you have anything to add. Um, yes, uh, thank you all so much for for listening to this and um, um, I would I would uh, just echo what Ke uh, Kelly just said and honestly um, what I, I think one of the earlier comments from from Dr. Vega um, regarding selection of where we're gonna uh, what basket are we going to put our eggs into and really focusing on those earlier ones um, that will help hopefully rise uh, boats over the life course um, as you put it also. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Samus. Closing comments, Dr. Barnes? Yes, I'd just like to thank you for, for this putting this together. I think it's so important. I agree with everything you said about the, the plan and having a goal. And I just really want to, to congratulate you all for, for bringing attention to the, the health disparity issue and, you know, and, and the health inequities in this disease. Because if we race towards a cure in 2025, the question is going to be a cure for whom? We have to make sure that we everyone is included in this cure. It can't just be one population. It's not one size fits all when it comes to Alzheimer's, unfortunately. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And thank you all. Um, we, um, we're gonna leave you with this. This is being recorded, so we'll send you all the link. We also have a summary, a, a one-page summary um, of all of this that we will send around along with. Um, many have asked for the presentation themselves, so we'll send it to you. Um, which includes a number of resources. So, um, you know, I'm going to leave you with sort of three things, I think, um, that um, have come up during this conversation. It's one, the importance of supporting prevention in public health, um, you know, support for CDC, the Healthy Aging Program, the BOLD Act are all critically important. 
you know, continuing to fund research to identify both preventive interventions and treatments and ensure that um, there is adequate uh, minority participation in research as well. And, you know, elevating and supporting um, the NAPA recommendations that I mentioned around the focus on risk reduction and, and health equity, along with um, the Change Act um, that Russ, Russ mentioned that is so important for early detection. Um, and um, we're available to answer any of your questions offline. Please send me an email. I think everyone has my email. Um, and I know there were a number of questions we didn't get to, and we will absolutely follow up with you. But I um, just want to thank everybody again for participating today. And, um, you know, I hope the rest of your day goes well. Thank you so much.